Good evening. Um, my name is Charles Hoke. I'm uh, actually giving this lecture from my office at the Johns Hopkins Hospital. I have to deeply apologize for not being there in person. Uh, initially, one of my surgical colleagues, Koshik Mandel, was going to deliver this lecture, but Koshik had a family um, emergency he had to attend to back in India, and um, I couldn't attend the meeting because of a conflict. So I do beg for your for your forgiveness for not making this in person, but I hope I can still give you some useful information. So the title of my talk, I, I call this Refining Hypotension in the Operating, Redefining Hypotension in the Operating Room in ICU Based on Autoregulation Monitoring. I'm primarily a cardiac anesthesiologist. Um, this slide depicts a major issue that we, are, we have to address um, in our clinical practices daily, and that issue is a rising prevalence of small vessel and large vessel cerebral vascular disease in our patients. Some series um, that have had performed scanning, MRI scanning in patients before heart surgery estimate that 50 to 60 percent of patients come to heart surgery with pre existing uh, cerebral vascular disease, either strokes, lacunae, uh, are, as in these two examples, primarily small vessel disease shown on the um, MRI to the right. And occasionally we'll have patients uh, with large vessel diseases. This uh, sort of devastating cerebral angiogram shows. This actually was a, one of my patients in the past. Uh, we don't get cerebral angiograms in all of our patients, but this patient had it because they had an occluded parotid artery, as you can see. They also had a very tight lesion to their um, MCA that's, that's, that's quite noticeable. Um, by the decrement and flow across the dye, across the lesion. So as anesthesiologists done primarily heart surgery, we have to deal with this um, the problem of, of increasing proportion of our patients having cerebral vascular disease. So this, this led our group to sort of step back a second and, and ask a question about how do we manage these patients during surgery? Well, one of the basic tenets of managing patients during cardiopulmonary bypass is that cerebral blood flow autoregulation remains intact if we use what we use as the alpha stat pH management. That's sort of the standard. So this means if autoregulation is intact, as this slide shows, and as you all know, is that blood flow is kept constant over a range of blood pressures as long as you stay within the autoregulation range. Now we know that some groups of patients, those with chronic hypertension, prior stroke, and other conditions may have their curve shifted to the right. However, we still empirically manage these patients. That is, we pick a blood pressure target based on past experiences, based on a modicum of, of data, but we, we choose a target and keep it there regardless of whether the patient has an autoregulation curve that's shifted to the right or, or normal. This in the past has meant keeping the mean arterial pressure at, at what we might consider dangerously low pressures in other environments, a mean pressure of 50 or 60. So we began to ask ourselves, is this really the best way to go? You know, if we could individualize blood pressure during surgery, if we can measure cerebral blood flow autoregulation, then maybe we could individualize to keep the pressure below, above the lower limit of autoregulation. Well, this became possible for us when we began to collaborate with the group at, um, at the University of Cambridge in England and the Addenbrooke's Hospital. Uh, who are reporting the use of autoregulation monitoring in patients with traumatic brain injury and other intracranial pathologies. Now, I think that many of you are well aware of this data. This slide, in fact, is uh, one that I've, I've, I borrowed from Merrick. Uh, they were doing this several ways. One is to measure the pressure reactivity index by looking at the relationship between cerebral perfusion pressure and intracranial pressure. In this slide, I'm showing another method, and that's using transcranial Doppler. Uh, if you see in this cartoon that we're insinating, the, the, the Doppler is insinating the middle cerebral artery. And you can see on the left top, there's a, a nice autoregulation curve. On the y-axis is flow velocity, and on the x-axis is cerebral perfusion pressure. So to do autoregulation auto monitoring, what we do is we simply look at the correlation coefficient between flow and cerebral perfusion pressure, or flow and pressure. If you're autoregulated, if you're in the flat part of your autoregulation curve, there's no correlation. That is, blood pressure changes, flow stays the same, you're autoregulated. However, if your blood pressure is outside the autoregulation range, this correlation becomes positive. That is, if your blood pressure goes down, your flow goes down if you're on the lower limb, and on the other side, if your blood pressure goes up, your flow goes up. 
So by monitoring the relationship between flow and pressure, we can monitor in real time, near real time, at the bedside, individual autoregulation curves. Uh, now there's some engineering to this. We look at low frequencies, frequencies that are associated with um, autoregulatory vasoreactivity, reactivity, uh, which is in the range of 20 seconds to three minutes. Um, it's near real time because we're looking at three, 300 second windows that are updated every 10 seconds. So it's a moving sliding correlation coefficient. In this slide, we use the variable MX, which stands for mean velocity index. And again, if you look at the curve, you can see that when the blood pressure is in the autoregulatory range, there's no correlation between flow and pressure, so MX is close to zero. But when the blood pressure drops below the lower limit of autoregulation, MX becomes positive because flow and pressure are now correlated, and the same for when you go above the upper limit. Well, Doppler certainly is, is an accepted standard for monitoring cerebral blood flow velocity, but it's not feasible in a lot of situations. Um, uh, but let me just show you some data. And this slide are, is real data we've got. We, we, we recovered from a patient we studied in the operating room during cardiopulmonary bypass. The top panel is really arterial, is arterial pressure from the entire case. And the bottom panel is sort of the time that the patient spends at each little five millimeter blood pressure bins. So you can see on the left, on the top two are the uh, left side of the brain, on the bottom two are the, are the um, right side of the brain. And the point I want to bring up here is that when you're autoregulated, the correlation between MX is, is close to zero, whereas when you're below the lower limit or above the upper limit, the correlation has now become positive. And you can see in this patient that, that they need a pressure somewhere around 90 millimeters of mercury during bypass to stay in their autoregulatory range. Now this is much higher than what we're doing now as a standard of care. And so this would show us that, that there are some patients that we probably need to have a higher blood pressure during bypass compared to what we do now currently. Now the second example is another patient. Sort of the same thing, the top panel is the arterial blood pressure. The top two are the left side, the bottom two are the right side, and the bottom graft is the percent time spent at each um, blood pressure bin. So in this patient, you can see that their lower limit of autoregulation, or when MX is close to zero, is much closer to 60. Uh, and uh, these patients would do fine with current management. Um, their pressure would stay within their autoregulated range by chance. Now, you can also notice in this patient that we start to see an upper autoregulatory curve. That is, with up increasing pressure, we're starting to see the index now becoming positive suggesting that this patient actually has an upper limit of autoregulation of somewhere around 75. Now, if we would have kept his pressure at 90 like the other patient needed, they would be on the upper end of their autoregulation curve, which not, may not necessarily be a good thing in this setting where there's a lot of microemboli in the circulation or a lot of inflammatory mediators. So if you had higher pressure, higher flow, you may have the tendency to break down the blood-brain barrier, get cerebral edema, and have more, a larger embolic load to the brain. So I think this point is a nice segue. This slide is a nice segue into the next um, slide. And this slide shows sort of the, a, a study we reported in 2012 where we looked at what we defined as the lower limit of autoregulation in patients having heart surgery. It's about 254 patients, if I recall. And what we did is we mapped the, on the x-axis the mean arterial pressure at the lower limit of autoregulation. And on the y-axis, we looked at the number of subjects with that LLA. Um, now, we used you know, some definitions of how we define it. That, you know, there's, it's, there's argument about which MX would, uh, if at all, would precisely identify what the lower limit of autoregulation is. But within those constraints, I think the, the take-home message is the same, and that is the lower limit of autoregulation in our patients during bypass varies between 40 and 90. It's not 50, like all the textbooks show us, 40 to 90. The average, it was about 66 with a 95% CI of 65 to, to 68. However, if you use just an arbitrary cutoff of 66 to 70, many, many patients still would have a lower limit above these levels and would be at risk for cerebral hypoperfusion during bypass. When we look at our patients who end up having a stroke postoperatively, their cutoff is about 74, whereas those without a C, uh, CVA is about 66. So I think this speaks for the fact that when we empirically manage blood pressure in the ICU or on cardiopulmonary bypass, we're really guessing. 
you know, what is the correct limit blood pressure to keep their blood pressure above the lower limit of autoregulation, it's a guess. It's very hard to, we, we can't predict based on demographic data, but based on preoperative blood pressure. We make the point that, that we probably have to monitor it if we're going to be precise. So you may say, so what? You know, so their blood pressure stays, is outside their lower limit of autoregulation. Does it really matter for patient outcomes? And we have a series of ongoing studies where we're addressing that. We have looked at our data for a couple of outcomes. And the first outcome we looked at was acute kidney injury. Um, there's, a, there's a thought that the brain may serve as sort of the index organ, if you will, for the rest of the body. In other words, if you perfuse the brain, for perhaps you'll perfuse the other organs in the body, particularly the kidney, which, it, which itself has a autoregulation mechanisms in place. So we looked at our data, and this was data from about 360 patients. And we classified patients um, in the left column, well, sort of the middle column, really, uh, if they had acute kidney injury or AKI. And this was based on the rifle criteria. Um, and then we also then looked at people without AKI. And if you look at the top, the top row, the average blood pressure during bypass, there really was no difference between these groups. Um, the, the average was 75 with a very similar uh, confidence intervals. What differed was the patients who went on to develop kidney injury actually had a higher lower limit of autoregulation to the brain. Theirs was nearly 70 compared to the patients without AKI, which was 63, and this was highly significant. What we also noticed, because the pressures were the same, but the lower limit of autoregulation was higher in the patients um, who developed AKI, we looked at this, this, this metric we call magnitude duration. In other words, we're not only concerned about how long the blood pressure is below the lower limit, but also the depth of it, how, how, how severe it is, a sort of an area under the curve. So when we looked at this metric of magnitude of blood pressure below the lower limit, this was highly significant for the patients who developed AKI versus those who didn't. So when we looked at multivariate modeling, even with this small number of patients, we found that the excursions of blood pressure below the lower limit and diabetes were independent predictors of AKI. So this would show you that perfusion below your lower limit of autoregulation has um, profound implications for the perfusion to the rest of the body. And it does just provide us with the opportunity to perhaps modify these risks by more precise blood pressure monitoring. So this is a graph I showed you before of, a, of, the, of an autoregulation curve in a patient. On the y-axis is the flow velocity, on the x-axis is the uh, cerebral perfusion pressure. Well, it sort of makes sense, blood pressure too low, hypoperfusion. Um, you know, that's kind of easy to accept, I think. What might be harder to accept is the fact that maybe blood pressure can be too high for a bypass. Again, we have a situation where we have a profound inflammatory response to surgery and cardiopulmonary bypass, organ ischemia reperfusion. We have a lot of inflammatory mediators. We have a lot of microemboli floating around the circulation. Having a situation where your blood pressure is high the higher the blood pressure, the higher the flow to the brain may have consequences to the patient in promoting cerebral edema. In fact, this is the mechanism for hypertensive encephalopathy, which I don't have to explain to you, of having too high of a blood pressure um, leading to cerebral pathology. So we recently have a paper um, published, um, I think I've got my slides out of sync, a paper published um, where we looked at um, looked at this relationship between blood pressure too high and outcomes, and we found out that indeed, if you looked at the magnitude and duration that the blood pressure is above the upper limit of autoregulation, it was actually an independent predictor of delirium after heart surgery. Now this was clinical delirium, this wasn't, uh, which over, over captures the hyperactive form and misses the, the hypoactive form of delirium, but nonetheless it shows that there may be implications to having your blood pressure too high. So our work to date really suggests that the blood pressure, uh, if it's too low below the lower limit of autoregulation, it has implications to the patient. And also, if it's above the upper limit of autoregulation, it has implications to the patients. So really what we're saying that it can't be too high or it can't be too low, and the only way you can really be precise is to monitor cerebral blood flow autoregulation. So how clinician, can clinicians do that? Well, our methods are really experimental. Uh, investigative methods where we take signals out of the monitors and, and we use transcranial Doppler. I think that the new, um, the new, uh, some new devices are becoming available that will make this 
make this common uh, more, more easy. And one, of course, is the Ornum Seaflow that's, that's been released. And you should probably know by now that the Ornum um, device is not only a nearest device, but it provides a metric of cerebral blood flow uh, using ultrasound methods. So it's a de very unique device, uh, first of its kind, to, um, that provides clinicians with information about not only nears or cerebral oxygen saturation, but also blood flow. Well, we've been using the, um, the Ornum device in patients having heart surgery, and what we've been comparing it to is Doppler, uh, transcranial Doppler. This slide looks at the comparison between mean velocity index and a similar index we obtained from the Ornum device we call the C-flow index, and this was during bypass. So with the mean velocity index is determined, just like I told you before, it's the correlation between slow wave um, changes in blood pressure and cerebral blood flow velocity. Uh, again, if there are correlations, if the correlation coefficient increases um, towards a positive number, it would suggest that your blood pressure is below the lower limit and vice versa for the upper limit. So the CFX is determined the same way. We look at the flow coming from the ornament machine and we put it into our software and we do a correlation between these low, uh, slow velocities in the CFX flow and blood pressure and, and we derive the CFX. So it's analogous to MX. And in this middle graph, we look at sort of the relationship. In gray is the CFX and in red is the MX. And you can sort of see in the, across time that the CFX performs quite clearly Quite, quite similar to the MX. Um, it looks like it's a pretty, and the top is the coherence. Uh, it looks um, quite clearly like that CFX might be a suitable substitute for MX, and it certainly will be a lot easier to use clinically than, than the Doppler device because it requires very little um, caretaker intervention. In this slide, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about an ongoing stomach, a study we're doing in patients having heart surgery. These are very preliminary results, um, but we're looking at the comparison of MX with CFX in 50 patients during bypass, and we're really trying to look at the accuracy of CFX versus MX. In this slide, I show you our result from our first 50 patients where we look at the correlation between MX and CFX, and you see that it's, it's highly significant uh, correlation that um, the, the CFX correlates highly with the MX during heart-lung surgery, and this is being run continuously during surgery. They're not episodic readings, these are continuous readings. Um, when we look at the bias analysis, there's very good agreement uh, between, between these two devices um, that, that the, looks, from what we can tell, that, that they, the two devices track quite, quite equally, and there's, there's very, good, um, very good agreement and bias. So, in terms of, we've also looked at the very, very early, in the same data, 50 patients. So it's only a small sample, but it does show the fact that this area under the curve of blood pressure outside the limit of autoregulation determined with MX or determined with CFX was different, again, in patients with AKI, which suggests the possibility, we need more patients to prove this, but would suggest the possibility that if you base your blood pressure management on CFX, you might provide a more optimal perfusion to the kidney and maybe reduce or modify the risk for AKI. So I'm gonna wrap it up now. This is a slide that taken from our intensive care unit, and it sort of shows what modern cardiac care is like. The patients are very complex. This patient uh, was headed back to the operating room. They were on ECBO. Um, they had an intraortic balloon pump. They were on CVH. They have a whole host of vasoactive drugs. You can't see it, but out of the picture is a nitric oxide machine and uh, we're headed back to the operating room. This patient needs to have their mediastinal re-explored uh, for, for some um, bleeding. And I think it sort of underlies the, 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 the basic principle that the patients that we take care of are getting more complex and they have more co comorbidities that predispose them to complications that we need to sort of advance our methods of monitoring to be more precise to individualize the care of these patients to more, more um, uh, optimize their blood pressure and blood flow to their organs. And with that, I'm going to wrap it up, and um, I, I appreciate your attention. I again apologize for not being able to make the, your, your, your meeting this evening, and um, thank you very much.